Richard Dawkins. Today I am called upon to honour a man whose name will be joined in the history of our movement with those of Bertrand Russell, Robert Ingersoll, Thomas Paine, David Hume. He's a writer and an orator with a matchless style commanding a vocabulary and a range of literary and historical allusion far wider than anybody I know. And I live in Oxford. <laughs> his alma mater and mine. He's a reader whose breadth of reading is simultaneously so deep and comprehensive as to deserve the slightly stuffy word learned, <laughs> except that Christopher is the least stuffy learned person you will ever meet. He is a debater who will kick the stuffing out of a hapless victim, <laughs> yet he does it with a grace that disarms his opponent while simultaneously eviscerating him. <laughs> He's emphatically not of the all-too-common school that thinks the winner of a debate is he who shouts loudest. His opponents may shout and shriek, indeed they do, but Hitch doesn't need to shout, his words his polymathic store of facts and allusions, his commanding generalship of the field of discourse, the fork lightning of his wit. I tried to sum it up in my review of God is Not Great in the Times of London. There is much fluttering in the dovecots of the deluded, and Christopher Hitchens is one of those responsible. Another is the philosopher A.C. Grayling. I shared a platform with both. We were to debate against a trio of, as it turned out, rather half-hearted religious apologists. Of course, I don't believe in a god with a long white beard, but I hadn't met Hitchens before, but I got an idea of what to expect when Grayling emailed me to discuss tactics. After proposing a couple of lines of attack for himself and me, he concluded, and Hitch will spray AK-47 ammo at the enemy. <laughs> in characteristic style. <laughs> Grayling's engaging caricature misses Hitchens' ability to temper his pugnacity with old-fashioned courtesy. And Spray suggests a scattershot fusillade which underestimates the deadly accuracy of his marksmanship. <laughs> if you are a religious apologist invited to debate with Christopher Hitchens, decline. <laughs> his witty repartee, his ready access store of historical quotations, his bookish eloquence, his effortless flow of well-formed and beautifully spoken words would threaten your arguments even if you had good ones to deploy. <laughs> A string of reverends and theologians ruefully discovered this during Hitchens' barnstorming book tour around the United States. With characteristic effrontery, he took his tour through the Bible Belt states, the reptilian brain of Southern and Middle America, <laughs> rather than the easier pickings of the country's cerebral cortex to the north and down the coasts. The plaudits he received were all the more gratifying Something is stirring in that great country. End of quote. Christopher Hitchens is known as a man of the left, except that he's too complex a thinker to be placed on a single left-right continuum. By the way, I've long been surprised that the very idea of a single left-right political spectrum works at all. Psychologists need many mathematical dimensions in order to locate the human personality. And why should political opinion be any different? With most people, it's surprising how much of the variance is explained by the single dimension we call 
left-right. If you know somebody's opinion on, say, the death penalty, you can usually guess their opinion on taxation or public health. But Christopher is a one-off. He is unclassifiable. He might be described as a contrarian, except that he has specifically and correctly disavowed the title. He's uniquely placed in his own multidimensional space. You don't know what he will say about anything until you hear him say it. And when he does, he will say it so well and back it up so fully that if you want to argue against him, you'd better be on your guard. He's known throughout the world as one of the leading public intellectuals anywhere. He's written many books and countless articles. He's an intrepid traveler and a war reporter of signal valor. But of course, he has a special place in our affections as the leading intellect and scholar of our atheist secular movement, a formidable adversary to the pretentious, the woolly-minded, or the intellectually dishonest. He's a gently encouraging friend to the young, to the diffident, to those tentatively feeling their way into the life of the free thinker and not certain where it will take them. And I saw this during the uh, signing that we had earlier this afternoon. We treasure his bon mots, and I'll just quote a few of my favorites. From the penetratingly logical, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. To the cuttingly witty, everybody does have a book in them, but in most cases, that's where it should stay. <laughs> To the courageously unconventional, Mother Teresa was not a friend of the poor. She was a friend of poverty. She said that suffering was a gift from God. She spent her life opposing the only known cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women and the emancipation of them from a livestock version of compulsory reproduction. The following is Vintage Hitch. I suppose that one reason I've always detested religion is its sly tendency to insinuate the idea that the universe is designed with you in mind. Or even worse, that there is a divine plan into which one fits, whether one knows it or not. This kind of modesty is too arrogant for me. And what about this? Organized religion is violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism, and bigotry, invested in ignorance, and hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women, and coercive towards children. And this, everything about Christianity is contained in the pathetic image of the flock. <laughs> His respect for women and their rights shines forth. Who are your favorite heroines in real life? The women of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran, who risk their lives and their beauty to defy the foulness of theocracy. Though not a scientist, and with no pretensions in that direction, he understands the importance of science in the advancement of our species and the destruction of religion and superstition. One must state it plainly. Religion comes from the period of human prehistory where nobody, not even the mighty Democritus, who concluded that all matter was made from atoms, had the smallest idea what was going on. It comes from the bawling and fearful infancy of our species and is a babyish attempt to meet our inescapable demand for knowledge, as well as for comfort, reassurance, and other infantile needs. Today, the least educated of my children knows much more about the natural order than any of the founders of religion. He has inspired and energized and encouraged us. He has us cheering him on almost daily. He's even begotten a new word, the hitch slap. <laughs> we don't just admire his intellect, we admire his pugnacity, his spirit, his refusal to countenance ignoble compromise his forthrightness, his indomitable spirit, 
his brutal honesty. And in the very way he's looking his illness in the eye, he is embodying one part of the case against religion. Leave it to the religious to mule and whimper at the feet of an imaginary deity in their fear of death. Leave it to them to spend their lives in denial of its reality. Hitch is looking it squarely in the eye, not denying it, not giving in to it, but facing up to it, squarely and honestly, and with a courage that inspires us all. Before his illness, it was as an erudite author and essayist, a sparkling, devastating speaker, that this valiant horseman led the charge against the follies and lies of religion. Since his illness, he's added another weapon to his armory and ours, perhaps the most formidable and powerful weapon of all. His very character has become an outstanding and unmistakable symbol of the honesty and dignity of atheism, as well as of the worth and dignity of the human being when not debased by the infantile babblings of religion. Every day, he's demonstrating the falsehood of that most squalid of Christian lies, that there are no atheists in foxholes. Hitch is in a foxhole, and he's dealing with it with a courage and honesty and a dignity that any of us would be and should be proud to be able to muster. And in the process, he's showing himself to be even more deserving of our admiration, respect, and love. I was asked to honor Christopher Hitchens today. I need hardly say that he does me the far greater honor by accepting this award in my name. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades, I give you Christopher Hitchens. I'm overwhelmed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and I did promise Richard that if, if, I, if my voice didn't go to rags, I would try and speak to you a bit, if that's all right. In, in acknowledgement, but I do so acutely aware that I'm the one standing between you and the Saturday night fever and the bars and the entertainments and so forth. And also we have a Q&A, we hope. So I'll be terse. As far as it lies within my power, I once got involved, through no fault of my own, in a presidential impeachment in Washington. Well, you may remember we had to learn a lot about a woman called Jennifer Flowers. Do you recall? Yes. Name spelled with a G. Bertrand, Bertrand Worcester, P.G. Woodhouse's great hero, said, Always beware of women who spell gladdies with a W or anything. Anyway, heedless of this, the president plunged on. In the, in the course of this, I had to discover about her that she'd once entered a Marilyn Monroe lookalike contest and had come forth. You may picture, therefore, comrades, my emotions at receiving not just the Richard Dawkins Prize, but the Richard Dawkins Prize from his own hands. <laughs> so I finally have, a, I finally have a, an inkling of what the blonde bombshell must have been um, going through. Um, a few years ago, um, a group of us met in the hospitality as it happened in my house because it was my hometown to see how we might review the battle against uh, 
democracy and theodicy, if you will, and all the rest of them. And because groups like that tend to need a nickname, my great brother unfortunately got called the Four Horsemen. I have to plead partly guilty now myself. I thought I'd better come up with something before anyone else did. And it was supposed to be the four horsemen of the counter-apocalypse. <laughs> but there it is. We got settled with it. And of course, long may this illusion flourish. It's promoted me to parity with Professors Dawkins and Dennis and Sam Harris. And I have set my whole life, I'd like to think, against the spread of delusion rather wish this one a fair wind. It's rather nice to be uh, associated in that, in that uh, company. It is true, however, that if we hadn't done it, someone was going to. There was going to have to be some kind of a pushback against what we could see coming. It was going to be a volunteer effort. It was going to communicate itself that way. How else were we going to reply to the increasing menace, rising menace of Islamic Jihad. How are we going to, uh, for example, deal with the emergence of probably the most reactionary papacy since the mid-19th century? Um, how, how are we going, excuse me, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I have to cough for a little bit. <coughs> I was afraid this would happen, I, I do terribly apologize. Um, a very reactionary Eastern Orthodox Church, if it comes to that, as well, the Eastern, the Eastern Catholic forces. Thank you. Um, now arranged, many of them, behind the dark and sinister figure of Vladimir Putin. Uh, then one mustn't exempt, of course, the millennial settlers in Palestine who believe that by bringing in as many fanatics of Jewish origin as they can, and forcing out as many Palestinian Arabs as they can, they may bring on the Messiah, and indeed the apocalypse, and look forward to the common destruction of our species with relish. And this, I think, lays a special responsibility upon us, uh, uh, particularly because the backers of these people tend to be in the United States. And though many of them don't like the Jewish people, and have uh, no love for um, all those who haven't accepted Jesus as their personal savior, they nonetheless are prepared to support extreme Jews, rather as the rope used to support the hanging man, make use of him while he brings on the Messiah, and then our reign of tribulation can begin too. What a wonderful bargain to be offering a democratic uh, country. Um, Richard is sometimes accused, you've heard it, of being overstrident. Before my voice went, I sometimes got accused of it too. <laughs> it's, um, it's a bit more reasonable in my case. I'm a sort of street-fighting polemicist from way back. I ask for it and I get it and I can dish it out. Richard is the defender of a great discipline, a wonderful discipline in biology with revolutionary and transformative power in the way we think, in our attitudes to medicine, into our attitudes to our origins, and to finding out how beautiful and rare and wonderful, even miraculous, reality really is when we look it in the face. How should he not be strident to see his discipline being attacked and defamed, to see attempts being made to drive it out of the academy, to have the uh, pseudo-scientific garbage taught now under the rubric of equal time. In the old days, the fundamentalists, if they could ban something, did ban it, as the Scopes trial proved. Losing that battle, they decided to go for equal time, an American way of fairness. Now they want it to be a sort of civil liberties and free speech issue. They've even got President Bush at one point to say, let's teach the debate. Well, by all means, let's teach the debate. But only in history class or perhaps in civics. What we're not going to have is, well, boys and girls, I hope you enjoy the chemistry period. Be ready for alchemy when you come back after the break. <laughs> Thank you.
up with this, up with this, we will not put. We're not going to have our children stultified and insulted by the teaching of garbage of this kind. And it seems to me an outrage that Richard has fewer friends in his profession. It's for them, I think, to rally and draw the sword and say, with our help too, that this nonsense uh, will not pass. Now, um, some of you know, well, I guess you all know now, that um, the words of one of my favorite poets, Ernest Dowson, are quite often with me. Um, Dowson stole them, actually, from the Roman poet Horace. Um, non sum qualis eram. I'm, I'm not as I was. Um, and though, as I know as well as you do, there's no point in arguing about the actual date or time of departure, because I like to think there would be no good time. I hope you agree with that. <laughs> uh, There would, there would always be something that I urgently felt I ought to do or say. And one mustn't repine or give in to self-pity about that. But at this present moment, I have to say, I feel very envious of someone who's young and active and starting out in this argument. Just think of the extraordinary things that are happening to us. Go, for example, to the Smithsonian Museum, to the new, I hope you've done, done it. <coughs> to the new Hall of Human Origins, magnificently curated new ex an exhibition, which shows, among other things, the, the branch or branches along which perhaps three, certainly three, maybe four if you count Indonesia, humanoid, shall we say, anthropoid species, died out not very long ago, within measurable distance of 75,000 years or so, possibly destroyed by us, possibly not, we don't know. We know they decorated their graves. We think they probably had language ability. We don't know if they had souls. I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> <coughs> we, we probably assume that they were deluded into having some kind of God. But no religion has yet pronounced on these cousins and brothers and sisters of ours because they don't fit. There's no way of fitting them into the ridiculous story that makes this tape wind round and round again and replay it and lead to us, to the grand solipsistic conclusion that this whole thing is designed with us in mind. But what a wonderful thing to be starting out in this tremendous new field of endeavor. How fabulous it would be if you had a gift for physics to get a job as an intern with Lawrence Krauss for example, who's just beginning to unravel, as very, very few people have yet dared to do the idea of the alternate and parallel universe. And with each horizon that we reach, we see more bending beautifully towards and away from us. The, the knowledge we have, say, not just of the uh, sentience, but also the cognition of animals is all of it incredibly recent a matter of decades, and enormously rich, and yet again, very much challenging our own claim to primacy or supremacy in, in the biosphere, and rich in every possible kind um, of discovery. I, I suppose I should begin to close now, because I've said all I wanted to say for myself, and I will join Richard if I may. You can ask me a question or two with your indulgence, but to say that I'm not going to quit until I absolutely have to, but that I... <coughs> oh, please. <laughs> but there's my... Well, I wasn't finished. I'm not done. Um, <laughs> Till I absolutely have to. Um, but I so envy those who could, who could glimpse, I only mentioned three or four of the things that have magnetized and charmed and, and gratified me to think about in the recent past and, and how, how, how much I hope that each of you forms some such ambition this evening and carries it forward. In the meantime, we have the same job we always had. 
to say as, as thinking people and as humans that there are no final solutions. There is no absolute truth. There is no supreme leader. There is no totalitarian solution that says that if you will just give up your freedom of inquiry, if you will just give up, if you will simply abandon your critical faculties, a world of idiotic bliss can be yours. <laughs> you will certainly lose the faculties. Uh, and you may not know as a result that the idiotic bliss is even more idiotic than it looks. But we have to begin by repudiating all such claims. Grand rabbis, chief ayatollahs, infallible popes, the peddlers of surrogate, and mutant quasi-political religion and worship, the dear leader, the great leader. We have no need of any of this. And looking at them and their record and the pathos of their supporters, I realize that it is they who are the grand imposters. And my own imposture this evening was mild by comparison. Thank you very much. I should have said that the uh, award is a, a beautiful collection of fossils, uh, a nautiloid cephalopod from the Devonian era. Um, so I guess we're to take questions, so questions to either Christopher or me. Um, and shall you sit down, shall I bring the microphone round? As long as I've got a microphone, yeah, it's okay. a little lovelier. You could sit together, right? Or I could stand. No, no right. Yeah. Go ahead. Cat, got your time. <laughs> I, I have no question. I just wish to thank you, sir, for making my life for 35 years a rational life. Thank you very much. I feel like I'm about to I acknowledge that I've transformed the world. What you have? What you have? I see some pictures. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Why in the world can't I have a hero like you? Well, because you shouldn't need or want to have heroes. Every time people say, when, when I'm signing a book, I'm a terrific fan, I say, I'm a fan. I don't want them for one thing. You shouldn't be one for another. I want a critical leader. Now, the only that is needful, I think, for our discourse. 